Okay. Hello everyone. Um, this is um, next in my intro astronomy series. Um, this is all about telescopes, the tools that astronomers use to collect all that electromagnetic radiation that uh, I talked about in the last section. So at its simplest, you can think of a telescope as a light bucket. In fact, many of us fondly refer to our telescopes as light buckets. Um, this is a good analogy because uh, you can think of the size of the telescope as being one of the most important features of that telescope. And by size, I mean the size of the lens, the primary lens or the primary mirror, as you see in these, um, in these images. The bigger the telescope in terms of that lens or mirror, the more light it can collect. Just as if it's raining, which it is actually doing outside for me right now, um, if you want to catch, you know, a lot of water from some particular rainstorm, you want to get a bigger, wider bucket to collect more rain. Um, so this works well with thinking of light as particles, like photons, um, but uh, it's, it's just a good measure. So the bigger the bucket, the bigger your telescope, that lets you see fainter and fainter objects. So your eye, you can think of as a telescope um, with a teeny, 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 tiny lens compared to most telescopes, all telescopes. Um, that can see a certain number of stars in the sky. If you look through binoculars, uh, the lens is a lot bigger than your eye, then you're going to see much fainter stars that you couldn't see. So it's not just that it's magnifying the image. That's what most people think is the most important part of a telescope. It's really about collecting as much light as possible so you can see faint objects. Um, big telescopes also do something. They improve resolution. So resolution is how fine the details that you want to see. So you want a really small angular resolution for it to be good. So these are some examples um, of uh, the, from the Hubble Space Telescope, which has really amazing, really good, uh, really good um, resolution compared to more advanced telescopes, um, ground-based um, and uh, uh, I would say telescopes that are in design, um, what those bigger telescopes would show you. So Hubble Space Telescope, it's an amazing telescope. It's uh, in orbit around the Earth, so it's free from the atmospheric effects of the Earth, which is great. It's also really, it's not that big. It's actually not that big of a telescope. Um, but some of the larger ground-based telescopes, um, by being larger, can get finer and finer detail. So you want big telescope for a lot of light gathering power. You also want big telescope uh, to improve your resolution. So to get smaller resolution, you can see finer details. Now the earth um, based observations uh, are obviously affected by the earth's atmosphere. So as humans, we like the atmosphere because uh, we like to breathe. As astronomers, we don't always like the atmosphere because it actually affects our observations. So the best ground-based sites for astronomy, um, you want a location that's calm, so it's not super windy. Uh, you want something that's at a high altitude, because the higher you are, the less of that atmosphere you have to worry about. Um, you want a place that's dark, so far away from sources of light that you know humans need to get around. Um, and a place that's dry, so you don't want to ha be somewhere with a lot of cloudy nights. So I'm teaching this course in Manchester, New Hampshire. It is not necessarily, it is not at all high <laughs> or dry. Um, in Manchester, it's not fairly dark. Uh, but we do have an observatory on campus where you can do some really cool stuff with an 8, 10 inch telescope. Um, you wouldn't want to put a gigantic eight meter wide telescope here in Manchester, it's not going to, you're not, your observations aren't going to be great um, because of these other factors, the atmosphere, the weather, all that stuff. 
it's an example of what um, we deal with when it comes to uh, light pollution, why we want a, a dark region. Um, the scattering of our light from street lights and cars and houses and buildings and all that stuff scatters through the atmosphere, um, making the sky bright so that you can't see the fainter objects. So like me, I grew up in Staten Island, which is a part of New York City, just barely. Um, super bright night skies. Um, I tried to be an amateur astronomer as a kid and wasn't very good at it uh, because <laughs> the sky was so bright. There were a lot of faint things I couldn't see. I didn't truly see the Milky Way galaxy, um, you know, as a visible band of cloudy band of stars overhead until I was in college. So probably the summer between sophomore and junior years when I was in New Mexico for the first time. Um, so most of us live in locations where there is some light pollution that makes it difficult to see the sky. Um, if you, if you go to or are from a rural location, you have a much different, uh, experience. So naturally astronomers tend to go to places where there aren't, there isn't as much, um, infrastructure with lighting, um, to build those big telescopes. Now you want the atmosphere to be calm because turbulence in the atmosphere is uh, an, actually a big deal. So this is showing two different views. This is a star viewed with a ground-based telescope that has to see through the atmosphere and a star viewed with the Hubble Space Telescope. So your re the resolution of the telescope itself matters, but your resolution is limited if the atmosphere is um, is moving around a lot. So if you look at your if you look at the stars with your naked eye, uh, you often see that stars twinkle. Um, that twinkling effect is a result of the turbulence or the moving atmosphere, the turbulent air. So that distorts our views. Twinkling is real pretty, but when you look at it through a telescope, it means the light is bouncing around and you can't get a clear image. Um, so that's why the Hubble Space Telescope even though it looks at uh, visible wavelengths that you can see from the ground, does a much better job um, than a ground-based telescope of the same size uh, because it's above all that atmosphere. Now, building a space telescope is a bit hard <laughs> and expensive. Um, for some types of telescopes, you don't have to go all the way to space. You just want to get to a high, dry, calm, dark site. So a lot of the biggest astronomical observatories tend to be built on very high, desolate mountains. Um, I have a couple examples coming up. Uh, one place, such place for this is the, uh, this is, I don't think this is the Atacama. I think this is uh, Mauna Kea, which I'll talk about near the end in Hawaii. Um, but uh, the Atacama Desert in the Chilean Andes uh, is an example of a, a place that's really high, um, far away from civilization, really dry, like it almost never rains, um, which is a good place to put telescopes. But we still want to put telescopes in space. This is the Hubble Space Telescope now, uh, what it looks like orbiting the Earth because some types of light don't make it through our atmosphere. So visible light, um, so this is showing the electromagnetic spectrum again from uh, short wavelengths on the left to long wavelengths on the right. And the depth of the dip tells you how transparent the atmosphere is to those types of light. Now it doesn't show full transparency over visible, although we basically do get, um, you know, most, not all of the visible light um, through our atmosphere. We know that there's distortions and stuff, so that might be why they draw it that way. But visible light um, is observable from space, again, with some atmospheric distortion. That's, I think, why they have that little bit there. Um, so people have been using telescopes for over 400 years now uh, because we can use them from the ground. Radio waves, so further down towards the right, that little dish uh, is showing you what a radio telescope might look like. I'll have some examples uh, after this. Um, radio light can also get through the atmosphere, a lot of radio light, not all of it. Um, so radio telescopes are often built on the ground um, because you don't have to go to space for that. 
There are some parts of, of the spectrum that are completely blocked at 100%. So gamma rays, x-rays, and almost all of the ultraviolet light. Um, a little bit of ultraviolet light gets through, obviously, which is why you need to wear sunscreen if you're out in the sun so you don't get, you know, sunburn and skin cancer and all those things. Um, it's not nearly enough to do astronomical observations with. Just enough to annoy humans, not enough to, to use telescopes. So those types of telescopes we have to put in space completely above the atmosphere. Um, infrared also partly some parts of it get completely absorbed by the atmosphere. Um, so you see it's kind of that mid-far infrared type, uh, what we call, because um, it's further away from the visible spectrum. Um, so you need a space telescope to see that. Some of the other parts of the infrared spectrum, as you see, there's like, you know, points where you can kind of see through. You can see some types of infrared uh, from Earth in those those little windows, um, but it's best if you do that again from a high altitude. So you can do some infrared from the ground, um, and you do your best infrared from um, uh, a high a high altitude, high location. So you're probably really familiar with visible light telescopes. Showed you a cross section of one of those um, of two of those uh, over here. Uh, if you're ever at our campus observatory, you'll see um, those types of telescopes as well, particularly like the one on the right. Um, we have a bunch of telescopes um, uh, that are, are eight inches across that folks can use. But what's not always as clear is how to observe those invisible bits of light. So, uh, of course, I uh, am a radio astronomer. I really like radio telescopes. I like radio telescopes so much I got a tattoo of one. Um, and that's uh, kind of what my, my uh, PhD dissertation was on as well. Um, this here is not necessarily a telescope. This is a satellite dish that you can use to watch satellite TV. Um, but it can function like a very, very, very simple telescope. This is, um, I uh, have a few of those that are set up as demonstrations. You can actually pick up the sun, the radio light from the sun, using one of these dishes. You can distinguish between the sun and the, the rest of the sky. Um, but radio telescopes that are, are used for observations, um, think of this, but huge. Um, one of the biggest examples of this is the Arecibo radio telescope which I finally got to visit about a year ago. Um, just like the mirror of an optical telescope focuses light, the metal dish here also focuses that radio light. Um, so it works in a very similar way, but it's, it's not um, shaped like a traditional telescope, how you expect it to look. Infrared and ultraviolet telescopes, um, these are actually both infrared type telescopes. Um, I can't, I don't think there's a dedicated ultraviolet telescope right now, but the Hubble Space Telescope also does ultraviolet. Um, on the left is an image of an airplane called Sophie, where out of which they actually stick an infrared telescope. So this is one way to get high in the atmosphere is to go on a plane. Um, and so they use that to do some infrared observations. And then here's a space telescope as well. So drawing of that on the right. Um, so infrared and ultraviolet light, they're similar in concept to optical telescopes, but the um, composition of the mirrors might be a little different because it's a different type of light it's reflecting, um, and the detectors might be a little different. Um, and again, ultraviolet needs to be above the atmosphere, some infrared needs to be completely above the atmosphere, and some of it um, does best from high mountains. Um, X-ray telescopes. Uh, it looks like a normal telescope from the outside, sort of, but uh, x-rays have so much energy that the mirrors are kind of around the side, so the light bounces around um, inside like that. So an x-ray telescope is going to be above the atmosphere as well. This is a, a picture of, or not a picture, a drawing of the Chandra Space Telescope. Gamma-ray telescope, um, this doesn't 
also doesn't look anything like a telescope because these are the highest energy types of light. Um, so focusing them is really difficult. Um, so you can't always get a really precise location on the sky, um, but they're getting a lot better at that. Uh, but those gamma ray telescopes, again, need to be in space. It's great for us because gamma rays and x-rays and ultraviolet light uh, are bad for life forms. They can, you know, destroy cells and molecules and all the things we need to live. So it's good that there's an atmosphere, but it is frustrating if you are an astronomer that wants to see that. Now, I said that early on that a bigger telescope gets you more light and it also gets you better resolution, smaller resolution. Um, the resolution also depends on wavelength. The shorter the wavelength, the better the resolution. For long wavelengths, like out to the radio, your resolution isn't very good no matter how big you build your telescope. Radio astronomers have figured out a way around that um, with a technique called interferometry. So this is a technique um, where you link two or more telescopes together so they have the angular resolution of a single large telescope. So you can put telescopes on different sides of the Earth, and if they're pointing at the same point in the sky, you can get really good angular resolution, much better um, than you could with any telescope you can build in one piece. Now you do sacrifice something for this. You do not, it's not as sensitive as a telescope that's the size of the Earth, right? Because you've only got one bit here and one bit here and a whole lot of empty space in between. Um, so it's not as sensitive to faint objects, but it does a much better job with angular resolution. Um, if you're taking this course with me, you're reading the book, um, they mention that optical interferometers exist as well. Um, optical interferometry is a bit more difficult than radio interferometry. They're like, they're like black belts of like the electromagnetic spectrum, uh, optical interferometry people. Um, so you're most likely going to see radio done with interferometry, although there's also optical interferometry. Uh, a real life telescope that does that is one you may have seen in picture in movies and pictures and posters. This is a very large array in New Mexico. It's 27 um, connected dishes. Um, this is um, was featured in the movie Contact, which is from 1997, which you probably haven't seen um, unless you've taken Life Beyond Earth with me. Um, they are very pretty and photogenic, especially when they're all close in like this. Uh, and um, fairly accessible if you are out in the southwest um, in New Mexico uh, and open to the public. So you see lots of gorgeous images of these working together. Um, one of the most advanced teles radio interferometers right now is the Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array. Um, this blue text uh, is from a when I used the slide in a different course where I had been soliciting questions via feedback form, um, people were asking what some of the most powerful telescopes were. Um, and in radio, um, ALMA, which is the acronym for this telescope, uh, is like one of the biggest, most powerful telescopes. It's also um, at a very high elevation. Uh, notice uh, this is one of the few photos that says photo by me. Um, I got to visit this in 2013 when um, for the inauguration of the telescope uh, and we were allowed to spend I want to say half hour at the high site where the telescopes are only allowed to spend a limited amount of time there because uh, I can't remember the elevation off the top of my head mm, I want to say 14,000 feet I could be wrong could be wrong on the internet um, that uh, elevation and I'm someone who lives at sea level uh, is n not an elevation that's good for uh, people who need oxygen, <laughs> I guess. Um, people who work at that site uh, occasionally have to have um, like oxygen tanks that you know pump oxygen in through their nose uh, because if you don't have a whole lot of oxygen, you um, your thinking can slow down, and you really don't want your thinking to slow down. You know, I'm gonna look it up now. Elevation. Eh. I was comp uh, okay. um, so it is, I didn't get it right, um, but I think it's around 14,000. Um, but that's great for the wavelengths this telescope's looking at, which is the microwave. Um, 
some of it makes it through the atmosphere, but n a lot of it gets blocked by the water in the atmosphere. So the higher mountain you're at, dry location, you can um, pick up those type that type of light much better. Also dark, it's there's a whole lot of nothing around um, uh, at this site. Um, what's coming next in interferometers is the square kilometer array. This is an artist's conception of what this might look like. There's going to be one uh, segment of this which will be built in South Africa and a in uh, the Karoo, um, which is also a place I've been lucky enough to go to to build stuff. Um, and then there's another location in Western Australia, so both very far away from any kind of uh, cities. Um, there, this one plans to have a lot of dishes so that you can get back some of that sensitivity to the brightness, um, but they're also spread out wide so you can get good angular resolution. Um, good, uh, I love this figure for giving you a sense of how big the biggest optical telescopes are. So for scale, there's a teeny tiny human um, near the bottom right. There's also a basketball court on the right side and a tennis court on the left side. Um, so these are the sizes of the mirrors of some of the biggest telescopes um, that are in use. So uh, the biggest, I think those are the two biggest refractors, the kind with the lens are up in the top left and notice they're really tiny compared to the rest because it's harder to build a big piece of glass that you just hold around the sides than a mirror that you can hold from the back. Um, so all of the biggest telescopes are made from uh, are, are mirrors. Some of the biggest ones that are made in a single piece are, I want to say, eight meters across. Um, you notice a lot of them are made of several different of several mirrors and like all of these little segments. Um, this is one way to build a mirror um, that's large without having to build one big piece of glass. Um, the biggest ones, a lot of them say planned or projected um, because uh, they don't yet exist. Um, but this actually has been updated just a few months ago um, because one of them uh, has recently been named the Vera C. Rubin Observatory. Uh, it it's, is known as the LSST. Um, uh, so that was named after that one's named after a famous astronomer. Um, one telescope in particular, if you're taking this course with me, this is going to come up in our discussion um, board and, um, is about the 30 meter telescope. In this course, uh, I like to talk a little bit about the human connection, um, which again, I tend to do more in, in the discussion boards um, and uh, things like that. The 30 meter telescope is proposed to be built on Mauna Kea in Hawaii, um, but there has been a lot of controversy, controversy um, surrounding that um, because um, Mauna Kea is a sacred site for indigenous Hawaiians. Um, there are already telescopes there. However, the history between um, the astronomers and uh, some of the indigenous communities hasn't always been, I guess, clear cut. Um, so if you are curious, um, if you're not in my course and you're curious about that, uh, there's a link um, to uh, Chanda Prescott Weinstein's list. Um, she has, it's called Decolonizing Science Reading List. If you just Google that, it'll probably take you right there. It's on Medium. Um, she started that uh, as a resource relating to the 30 meter telescope. However, um, it's expanded beyond that as well. If you are in my class, there's two diff there's two readings um, that you'll see on the discussion board. Uh, so we'll be getting into that on the, the site. Okay, so highlights here. Telescope diameter matters for light collecting power. So big bucket and resolution. So tiny resolution, tiny, tiny um, details that you wanna see. Choosing a uh, ground-based location uh, depends on primarily the atmospheric factors, but also um, getting away from major sources of light. Um, some telescopes need to be in space to see certain parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. Others, you do well on high mountaintops. Um, and interferometers are really awesome because you can improve the resolution, particularly for radio telescopes. 
um, by building telescopes that, uh, again, span the, the size of the globe. When we talk about black holes a little later in this course, um, I'll mention uh, a telescope that actually does that. So that's it, and I will see you next time.